Greetings, friends, and welcome back to Worship with the Longmeadow Congregational Church, United Church of Christ in Auburn, New Hampshire. And if you are joining with us for the first time, my name is Pastor Ruth. I'm the pastor of the Longmeadow Congregational Church, and I welcome you to worship with us on this very special Sunday. Throughout the year, we are preparing a series of what we are calling Faith in Action Sundays, when we invite in special speakers who are doing work in our local area that we would like to be part of, that we would like to act on our faith, to show our love and to give service to those who are most vulnerable and those whom God loves. And so we want to do that today. We ha are, have invited Mr. Dave Saunders, who it works with an organization called Sleep in Heavenly Peace. And we invited him in to tell us more about the work they do so that we can come alongside them and also work with them. And so I'm going to let Mr. Sauters uh, explain far better than I ever could, but I just want to thank you for joining us here in worship. Um, if you would like to support the ongoing ministries of the Longmeadow Congregational Church, I've provided an address in the description down below where you can send any donations of support that our ministries may continue and we may continue to come to you here on YouTube. And so without any further ado, I invite you to join us in worship as we pray and listen to scripture and to reflect on that scripture and how we can put our faith into action. Thank you for joining us. On this day, we give thanks for the ministry of Sleep in Heavenly Peace. Each week, we raise up a, a particular ministry within our church, and we look forward to an ongoing sharing with you, and that we may serve God's children. As we listen and learn, I invite you to Please pray for their powerful ministry and that God may lead us to a way that we can serve alongside them. I also invite you to join with me in praying for God's beloved in Lewiston, Maine and in the surrounding cities, as you I'm sure no doubt have heard there was another act of senseless violence there in which 18 people lost their lives, and I'm not sure the exact account of those who were injured, but we hold them all up in prayer, as well as all of the people in the area who lived in fear, and as law enforcement sought the shooter, and we also hold up the law enforcement and the first responders who acted so quickly. We pray for all of those involved, and we pray for are there any joys or concerns that you would like to share? Jackie? Probably transcend into announcements, but the joy of working with Jim and again um, creating the um, Sunday School lesson bag. So we will we have great ideas for the month of November with the theme of being thankful. Um, so we're going to continue working on those um, and you will see them first week. Wonderful. So they will be available for a the whole month of November. We have different activities for them. Wonderful. For, so those of you who have children or grandchildren at home, you can take one, pick them up. They're complete lessons to go. And thank you to Janet and to Jackie for your ministry here. Jared. It was a joy yesterday to work with Anchored and Hope and Boy Scouts at the supper. Uh, crowd wasn't that large, but thank you all that came out. And we had a good time, and that's it. Thank you. Right. <laughs> Thank you. Paul. Oh. That yeah, all shows up before, but I will say I really appreciate being here. We appreciate you. So. Yes, Jeannie uh, <coughs> goes in for surgery November 1st. Mary. Yes, my two friends, um, Tina and Lisa, are caregiving for their moms, and it's been a challenge for them. So for their moms and for them, prayers, please. I will 
born and raised in Lordston, Maine. Thank you for your prayer. I want to bring awareness more importantly to the lack of mental health guidance. In Maine, it is, it is about 2,000 mental health workers. Very, very, very behind. Facilities are closing all the time. We are, thank the Lord, didn't hit us here. It hasn't hit us here in New Hampshire. But what's left there in North Beach, my sister is still there, my family is, our family is all there, and it is just so sad. But the biggest thing I, I want to, is the mental health issue. This gentleman, he's, he put himself in the hospital. He's been on, for weeks and weeks, he's been on police alert. And he still had a gun. And he had many guns, and that lack of not being aware of what's going on around you or the people that do suffer from mental illness. Just, just be aware. Absolutely. And help yeah. where you can. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. And will you all be with me in a spirit of prayer? Loving and leading God. We want that kind of faith that trusts in your goodness and protection even in the midst of frightening storms. We don't just want to be amazed that you can and will take care of us. We want to be convinced of it. We want to be courageous and calm even when in the valley of the shadow of death surrounds us. We want to believe that you are there and that you will see us through every hard time. We want this great faith Sometimes we feel that we cannot produce it. We can name it, but sometimes we can't make it. And so we open our hearts to your leading as you call us to take our faith and put it into action with joy and in serving you and your children. On this day, Lord, we give you thanks for our siblings in faith in churches throughout the New Hampshire Council of Churches, and this week we especially raise up to you the First United Methodist Church of Rochester, the Center Point Community Church of Salem, St. David's Episcopal Church of Salem, Triumphant Cross Lutheran Church of Salem, Ararat Armenian Congregational Church of Salem, First Congregational Church of Salem, and the Pleasant Street United Methodist Church of Salem. We give you thanks for the light these churches are in their communities, and we pray that you will bless them, that they may continue to be a blessing we also raise up to you each week a particular ministry of our church in this week. We ask that you bless the ministry of sleep in heaven and peace. And for the ways we will hear of how we can come alongside them to serve the most vulnerable of your children. Bless their efforts and bless the children who will receive the beds they make. That they may feel safe, comforted, and beloved. We also ask that you bless our ladies' circle in these final weeks of preparation for their annual snowflake fair. We thank you for all the people who have been crafting and putting together baskets, those who are baking and cooking, those who are planning the, the pork pies, all of the work that goes into making this a wonderful opportunity not only for our church but for our entire community to gather around and celebrate. And we ask that you bless them as they continue their preparations. And Lord, we also thank you for the ministry of our Christian Education Committee as they prepare worship bags to go and welcome bags for our breakfast as well as uh, lessons to go. We thank you for their ministry, for their love they have for our children, and for their willingness to share their skills. We also give you thanks for the wonderful dinner that was held here last night to benefit Anchored in Hope. We thank you for all who worked at it, all who volunteered, including the Boy Scouts, and those who work regularly with Anchored in Hope. We pray that the money they raised will be used to make a real difference in the lives of people who currently live on the streets. And we pray that our continued partnership with them may flourish and bloom. 
And Lord, we ask a special blessing this week on our brother Paul as he continues on his journey. We, we have been blessed to travel together in faith during his time with us, and we pray that you will bless him and the journey that lies ahead for him, for the church where he will be attending, and for his health and his growth in faith and joy in you. Patient God, you know us better than we want you to sometimes. We like to think that we can fool you with our bravado and high-flung phrases of faith. We hear the story of the disciples on that storm-tossed boat and we think that we would never have doubted. And in our arrogance, we believe it. But you know us fully. You know that we all have our moments of doubt and our moments of fear. We all wonder at times where you are. We want to know that everything is going to turn out for the best because we are frightened at times. And in our fear, we cannot even face our own doubts. Help us to understand your forgiving grace. Help us to know that you understand our weakness and our confusion and that your love extends to us in spite of that weakness. Strengthen our faith and our commitment to you, we pray. And on this day, we pray for all of those who are ill, awaiting test results, co receiving treatment. We continue to pray for Julia and Catherine as they learn to live with chronic health issues. And we also hold up to you our sister Jeannie, who will be having surgery this week. We pray that you will surround them with your presence as well as with compassionate and skilled caregivers, that they may be healed and feel whole again once more. We pray for all those who have died and for those who are grieving. And we hold up to you now your beloved children in Lewiston, Maine, those who lost their lives and rest eternally at peace with you, those who were injured, the families who grieve, and worry, and all those who have lived in fear of this shooting. We also hold up to you in thanksgiving the police officers and first responders who acted so decisively and compassionately for the community. But Lord, in the midst of this, we also ask you to help all of us to have a better awareness of mental health issues, too find ways of increasing mental health care. In all of the things that we have lost during the pandemic, mental health services have been one of the hardest hit. Clinics are filled, and people feeling burnt out are leaving. And so we pray that everywhere these services may increase, but we are especially mindful that in Maine there is a particular scarcity, and we pray that you will help them to fund and find a way to increase these services. Lord, we also hold up to you Tina and Lisa, who are caregiving for their moms. So many of us, if we are fortunate, have our parents into elder age, where they require more assistance and an extra hand. But we also are mindful that although given with love, this takes a toll on caregivers everywhere. And so we pray that you will surround Tina and Lisa with your love. Help them to know that they are not alone. Help them to reach out for what assistance they can find. And may their time, this time with their moms be sacred and beautiful. Lord, we hold up to you all those who are struggling with challenges in their lives of which we have no knowledge. But we pray that you will make us mindful, that you will make us alert and aware that we may come alongside people when they are hurting, just to be present and let them know that they are not as we have offered prayers for those near and dear to us, as we have lifted situations of darkness and fear before your throne of grace, 
Help us to be people who truly believe that you hear our prayers and answer them. Where we have not seen, give us faith to believe in all you have said and done as we lift our hearts to you now in silence. Loving God, we have seen your face in loved ones and strangers around us. We have heard the call. We have been assured of the love that you may be glorified and your reign may come. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. The scripture reading this morning is from Matthew chapter 8. Verses 18 through 27. Now when Jesus saw great crowds around him, he gave orders to go over to the other side. A scribe then approached and said, Teacher, I will follow you whenever, wherever you go. And Jesus said to him, Foxes have holes, birds in the air have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. <clears throat> Another of his disciples said to him, Lord, first let me go and bury my father. But Jesus said to him, Follow me, and let the dead bury their own dead. And we, when he got into the boat, his disciples followed him. A windstorm suddenly arose on the sea, so great that the boat was being swamped by the waves. But he was asleep. And they went and woke him up and said, Lord, save us, we are perishing. And he said to them, Why are you afraid, you of little faith? Then he got up and rebuked the winds and the sea, and there was dead calm. And they were amazed, saying, What sort of man is this, that even the winds and the sea obey? Foxes have holes and the birds of the air have nests. They all have a place to call home, a place where they can feel safe, a place where they can truly find the rest they need to refresh and to build their strength for what lies ahead for them. We all need rest, we need safety, we need home. In order to refresh and build our strengths for what life brings to us each day. Jesus even needed rest and tried to get some when the storm arose in the sea. He was able to still the storm, but who knows at what cost. Each day we all encounter storms. Storms in our lives that we need to face. And we need to truly rest, to literally sleep in order to have the strength to do this. And we often do not even consider what an incredible privilege, what incredible luxury it is to simply have a place to lay our heads at night and to get the rest that we need to face the storms of our lives. But this is not the case for every person. Every night, thousands of people, thousands of children, have no bed where they can safely lay their heads to get the rest that they need. For the past several weeks, we have been listening to Jesus, Jesus calling and teaching his disciples as they approach Jerusalem, as they follow him and they learn what it means to follow the call beyond his life, to live out our baptism, to do justice, to fiercely share hope in the world, and to shine our light brightly in the world. You see, Christianity, discipleship, our faith is not about just believing. It is about putting our faith into action. Today it is a blessing for us to hear from David Sauter's who has come to share his work with Sleep in Heavenly Peace, an organization 
that actually builds beds for children so that they have a place to lay their heads to rest and to renew and to feel safe for whatever storms or joys lie ahead of them in the morning. And so I'd like to invite Mr. Saunders to please come forward. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. Thank you for allowing me to come here today to talk about our mission of Sleeping Heaven with Peace. And I will have to apologize for my first attempt at doing this back in April when uh, I had a bit of an issue. I, I was thinking, I know how much Woody likes surprises. And so I'm sitting in the back of an ambulance saying, Woody, a funny thing happened on the way to the forum. <laughs> um, I have an aneurysm and I'll have brain surgery tomorrow. So, um, so anyway, so my apologies for not being here in April, but um, I'm very happy to be here today. So um, again, thank you for, for having me here. Uh, and, and thank you, Ruth, uh, for the, and the um, passage from Matthew and such an eloquent overview of the issue of bed, bedlessness here in the United States. And it's actually all over the world, but the focus here on the U.S. Um, and speaking of which, did you all have a good night's sleep last night? Yeah, yeah, okay, that's good. That's good. Well, imagine sleeping last night without a bed. Let's say you're sleeping on a blanket on the floor in the family room, or in the basement, or in the back of your car, or on the streets. Um, my guess is you wouldn't be as perky this morning as you currently are. So now imagine doing that day after day, week after week, month after month, and even year after year. Uh, with lots of people, men, women, kids, who suffer that issue. We'll be talking about that, that, that today. So, we currently live in an era where there's some 350 million people here in the United States. And sadly, almost 12% of those people are at the poverty level. And that means a lot. People who don't have enough money for housing, for food, or for simple things like beds. There's also 74 million kids in that mix, and of which 2 to 3% of those kids across the country under 18 years of age don't have beds to sleep in. That's roughly 2 million kids across the United States that don't have, don't have beds. So it's a big issue. Like, and there are, unfortunately, there are lots of issues in our society today, but that's just one. Um, so this morning, I'd like to take you down my path toward doing something about that issue here in this local area. Um, first, a, a few words about myself. Um, I'm, uh, I'm married with four kids, three wonderful grandkids. I'm an airplane guy. Uh, I've worked at uh, NASA and Boeing and General Dynamics and Lockheed before retiring after 40 years of work. And I thought retiring was awesome. And I got two years into my retirement and I began to feel like I had no purpose. And kind of depressed and kind of listless and was like, whoa, is this it? So, and my wife is still working. So I was also like, well, we can't do anything because she's still working over a VA system. So, and I had the blessing of having exposure to three people who ultimately changed my life at the end of 2018. One was a four-star admiral who commanded the Joint Special Operations Command. The second was a water treatment plant engineer in Twin Falls, Idaho. And the third was Mike Rowe, the dirty jobs guy. So you, okay, connect the dots on those. So I know it's a little bit hard. So anyway, so in September of 2018, I'm browsing on YouTube, good luck, well, I have no purpose in life. And, and there's this speech by Admiral Brad McCraven at the University of Austin uh, 2014 commencement speech. And it was a, a very, very moving and inspirational uh, video and speech. There are two points, out of many points he made in that speech, are two points that resonated with me. The first was, one person can change the world by giving people hope. And the second was, the importance of lifting up the downtrodden. Now, all the things he said, those two just kind of stuck in there, and they were kind of mulling him around. Then you fast forward to December, and um, I'm watching CNN's annual program on heroes. What they do is they recognize people across the United States who've done good things to help others across their communities. And so I'm watching this, and, and Brian Cranston from um, Breaking Bad uh, introduces a guy by the name of Luke Mickelson from Twin Falls, Idaho. And 
Luke tells a story in this presentation of uh, one Christmas, he was approached at church by a woman uh, who said, I know this young lady, she has two kids, she finally got an apartment, she's been homeless for a while in Twin Falls, and they don't have beds. And so Luke looked at his kids who have been complaining about, we're not going to get anything good for Christmas. He says, okay kids, well, there's this family that has no bed, so we're going to make them a bunk bed. So they did it. So he and his kids went in the garage and they built a bunk bed for this family. <laughs> And delivered it. And of course the kids were thrilled and their mother was, was very happy and had for her kids. And I wouldn't call it a mistake, but he then posted it on social media. And within a week he had over 60 requests for beds. So for him, that was a, oh, geez, there's an issue here that we don't think about, but there was. And so he, that was the, the, the point where he decided to start to form a charitable organization to help these kids who don't have beds in their own. That was in 2012. And his overall mission is um, get these kids off the floor. And his tagline for Sleep in Heavenly Peace, as we'll talk about, was no kid sleeps on the floor in our town. Because he didn't want to make it local. He wanted to do this across the entire country. So off he went. So then in January, as I'm thinking about this whole Sleep in Heavenly Peace thing, I'm thinking, well, I should find out more about this. Because it kind of resonates with me. You know, lift up the downtrodden. Yeah, one person can change the world. So I'm poking around on YouTube again. Yes, I'm sorry. Um, and, and there was a Mike Rowe, the Dirty Jobs guy, he had a YouTube series called Return the Favor. And he did one on Sleep in Heaven and Peace. And I'll just say, Mike, you typically, what he'll do, he'll show up and um, find someone doing good for them, for the community. And then behind the scenes, he'll do something great to help them grow their, their charity, which he did. Very moving. And I saw that, and I go, I can do this. So I had an epiphany at that point where I've been all kind of introspective, to, you know, what I do with the rest of my life. I'm frustrated, I'm kind of depressed because I'm not rock and rolling anymore. And I had an epiphany, well, it's not about me, it's about helping others. And so I decided, let's go. So off to Twin Falls, Idaho, I went in March of 2019 for training. And by the way, if you ever get a chance to go to Twin Falls, Idaho, I know it sounds like a cow tipping town. But they have beautiful, better, I think, than Niagara Falls. So you get out to Idaho, go to Twin Falls. Anyway, so I went out there to learn how to become a chapter president, how to open a chapter here in New Hampshire. And so I did. And I learned a lot. The foremost of which was the issue with bedlessness and the fact that so many kids are without beds. And the emotional and physiological effects of not having beds. You might imagine sleeping on your basement floor for a couple of weeks. You get the aches and pains, you have a lousy night's sleep. If you're in school, you have a hard time staying awake in school. And typically in a situation, I don't even have a bed, let alone have a desk at home to do my homework on. So it's a big issue for the kids. Also, it makes the, the parents feel awful because they, I, don't need, I can't afford a bed for my kid. Um, so um, it, it's, a, it's a big, big issue. And then they went on with the training on how to, how to secure volunteers, build beds, and all that stuff. And we, which was, the training was wonderful. So back, back here I came. And did some research. You could, you could say, I want to do open a chapter for my town, the state, which was too big, even though New Hampshire is small, and I ended up picking Hillsborough County. So I went to the 2020 census data, uh, or the, the last census, it wasn't 20, I guess it was 2010 census data, and there are kind of the number of kids between the ages of 3 and 18 years of age, and of those, 2 to 3% don't have beds based on the national average. So that's around 2,000 kids in Hillsborough County. So, um, I decided to do something about that. <clears throat> so, the situations that we typically deal with, it's, it's a mother or father, typically a mother, who is either separated from their husband, they've been divorced, they got pregnant, and the, and the, the father goes away, and they're kind of on their own. And many of our, our I'll call them customers, have just recently gotten into housing. They've been living on the street, they've been living in a shelter, they've been living in their Uncle Bob's basement. The situations are many and varied, but they've just finally gotten shelter. And thank goodness there are organizations across this area, across the county, that help people like this. They find apartments that are available, they'll get government subsidized loans for them so they can put them in this housing and they get them food. But quite frankly, 
That's all they get from these organizations. Because there's no one there giving them furniture. And so they're in these apartments many times with nothing. In fact, many times after we deliver the uh, best to these kids, the only furniture they have in their homes are the best for the kids. So examples, we have, uh, and these are just a, kind of a cross section. There was a, a lady um, about 55 years old in Peterborough, New Hampshire. Her daughter had died of a drug overdose. And this was, she was a widower, so she was by herself, was kind of looking forward to her retirement, and suddenly she has five kids. Uh, ages uh, 4 to 16. Um, we had another girl who was 13 years old, had never had a bed in her life. Um, we had a family in Nashville that had three teenage, full-size teenage girls sleeping on a ratty mattress on the floor uh, in their apartment. And then most recently we had a family who we delivered eight beds to, eight kids in their house. So, and we see this stuff all the time. So um, the good news is, with support from like, you know, organizations like um, churches, uh, com uh, community organizations, individuals, uh, I don't know, like the Dairy Rotary Club, would you? <laughs> <laughs> uh, we're, able to, we're able to do something about this. So, so Safe and Heavenly Peace, we're a 501c3 charity. And, and so um, and we're all volunteer. Our Hillsborough County chapter, including myself, we're all volunteer. And we essentially get a bunch of people together, and we make beds for kids between the ages of 3 and 17 years of age. And we deliver these beds, bring them in, they're, they're handmade wooden beds, they're not beautiful, but they are rugged, and, and we uh, deliver them with new mattresses, sheets, blankets, pillows, uh, pillowcases, and comforters, and so they come with a complete brand new uh, bed for them. And again, our whole mission is to get these kids off the floor and into beds of their own. Um, so, how does Sleep with Heavenly Peace operate? How do we do what we do? Well, first of all, you can't run a car without gas. And our gas is, comes in the form of donations, either financial donations from some of the organizations I was talking about, uh, or in-kind donations of things like uh, quilts, blankets, sheets, pillowcases, trailers. <laughs> we, got, we got an 18-foot trailer from um, the Dairy Rotary Club, which is, we use for all of our tooling, which is fantastic. So this gives us the, the resources we need from a material standpoint to, to do what we do and to make these beds. But I don't do this all by myself, so I also need human resources to make this happen. Again, coming from the aerospace industry, I knew nothing about running a charity. And it's like running a small business. You have to do Funds come in, you got to account for everything, you've got to organize volunteers, you find volunteers, and sweep the floors, do the trash, there's a lot going on. So, we, we, you get a bunch of volunteers together, and you typically have about, you have a core team of people to kind of work with you to make this thing successful. And then, you go off and build beds. We build beds, like we're building beds, we're building um, 32 beds on Wednesday of this week at Bishop Burton High School in Nashville. Typical example, on Friday, four of us went to Lowe's and we bought um, 32 beds worth of lumber, about three tons worth of lumber. It's in a U-Haul truck in my driveway right now. Then we show up on Tuesday morning with this 18-foot beautiful trailer, please, you know, Rotary Club, and we set up we set up essentially manufacturing flow lines in the gymnasium. And this manufacturing flow line has a lumber pile at this end, and at the end of the day, we have headboards, safety rails, and side rails on this end of the room. And we essentially cut, we sand, we drill, we assemble, we stain using vinegar and steel wool, which is how we did it a few hundred years ago. You put steel wool in vinegar, it dissolves, turns it, turns it brown, it's great. It's cheap, it's fast, it's, it's really good stuff. And it worked for George Washington. <laughs> and, um, and so and then we actually brand, we go on and we actually have a branding iron, we brand SHP on the headboards, which is the danger part, which is why the guys do that stuff. So, uh, so we brand it, then the, then the finished headboards come back to Amherst, where I live. We have a, a barn that someone's allowing us to use. We put all the, the uh, stuff in there. While all this is going on, people who need beds find out about us through the Department of Health and Human Services, Friends of Forgotten Children, Step Up. Organizations find know where these, most of these people are. Plus, we have a very, very active um, Facebook page where we use a network to find people in need. And then they submit a bed request in through the shpbeds.org website. 
And if it's any one of the 35 different zip codes that I cover, it comes to me. So now we know there's a need, and then one of my core team members, Deb, gives them a call and, and finds out their situation. We don't ask any financial information, by the way. In fact, we've delivered beds to really nice homes that had no furniture inside because they're house poor. The, the kids have no control over that, so we're going to get to the bed. So Deb calls them and coordinates the time and we do the best for them to deliver a bed and says things like, please keep the roller skates off the stairway and the dogs put away and things like that. So then we gather a small team, three to four people, and we take, go to the barn, grab our stuff, grab our tools, charge our batteries, and off we go, and we install these beds. And if the, if the parents would allow, and if the kids want, we'll take pictures of the kids with their beds and then post them on a Facebook page without using any names, because it just helps us get more donations and fewer what we do. And by the way, the best part of this job is only the beds the kids. And that's where the rubber meets the road. So, <clears throat> At Moma Craven, one of the things he talked about was the power of one person. You know, one person can change the world. So, if you just look at me, just some goober engineer who came out of, you know, the other place and didn't know what to do with his life, and well, you know, maybe I can do something. So, anyway, so I've, I've done, I've done something. And it started in 2019, we had our first build day in June of 2019. I have a core team now of about 25 constant team members to help me do what we do as, a, as an organization. After Wednesday's build day, we'll have done 28 build days since 2019, where we get people together in golf courses, and parking lots, and gymnasiums. And that's, there's a lot of effort, <laughs> put it that way. Uh, but we built six, almost 600 beds uh, in those uh, 28 build days. So we've delivered 421 beds so far. And our plan is to get to 500 beds, the milestone of 500 beds delivered by the end of this year, and the remaining uh, gets up to 600 by the end of the first quarter of 2024. So uh, the good news is we now have a machine essentially to this organization to deliver those beds. The bad news is we can't keep up with demand. This demand is hot. And the more people find out about it, the more the, the bed requests come in. And we've involved over 2,000 volunteers. Now, we're a bit like, if you ever take a rock and throw it in the pond and you see the ripples going on, you know, if you do something nice for someone, you hold the door for them, and they drop a $10 bill and give it back to them, people tend to pay that forward. So, one of SHP's hallmarks is they get the people involved. They're just not giving money to an organization and walking away. Come help us build beds. Help, come help us deliver beds. They see what it's like to, to jump in and actually get hands-on experience helping other people, and then, their families and friends see them doing that, and they start doing things nice for other people, and it begins to, to compound, like those ripples in the water, it begins to spread. Um, you look at Luke Mickelson, back in 2012, he helped one family. And now, at the national level, since 20, 2012, they have 355 chapters across the United States. Um, they built over 180,000 beds, they've delivered over 160,000 beds, and involved over 330,000 people across the country. So, doing good is a good thing, and by doing that, it actually can spread. So, you can see the power of one person who just makes their mind up to do something, and the effect that it can have on people around the country, and around your community. So what have I learned from all this? Um, the need is great. And I knew nothing about the support and welfare organizations in the, or in the area, and I've learned a lot. There, there are issues, as, as Ruth um, was just explaining, there's homelessness, there's depression, there's drug addiction, hunger, um, just people not having anyone to talk to, or people who don't have any, any kind of loving support or men men mentorship. There's lots and lots of opportunities essentially out there where people need help in one way, shape, or form. And the good news is there's lots of organizations that are looking for people, whether it's an hour a week or full time, to help them help these other people. Organizations like SHARE, Girls at Work, The Front Door Agency, Bless This Home, Friends of Forgotten Children, and Age 68 Hours of Hunger, Big Brothers, Big Sisters, and oh yeah, Sleep in Heavenly Peace, because we can always help <laughs> people. Um, and the good news is as well, there's an organization called Volunteer NH, where you go onto their website, volunteernh.org, and you can just see lots of opportunities to help out. 
uh, again, helping out is a relevant thing. As much time as you can afford, um, you can do it, but it's, it's the opportunity is there and there's ways to get to that. Also, I found that there are lots and lots of wonderful people out there who want to help. They just don't know how and where. So, and I've been blessed with finding people who are kind of like-minded, who want to do something to help others, and now they have a conduit for doing that. Um, I've also found that by stepping out of your comfort zone and doing something different and helping other people, your social network explodes. Because if my world was this big back when I was sitting at home retiring, scrubbing, walking the dogs and cutting the grass, it, it is now this big because of all the people that we've interfaced with, all the volunteers and the sponsors and the kids we've, we've worked with, it's, it's really an incredible uh, gift. And I've also found that, yeah, even this goober can do something um, to make a difference in a, in a person's life. So, again, it doesn't have to be huge. It can be anything. Just taking someone out to lunch once a week who you think might be lonely. So it, it, you can do something for someone, and it, it's better for them that you do it. It's also better for yourself. And I also found as well, it takes a village. <laughs> I tried to do most of this when I first started myself. And then you realize you know, that you've got to put people in to make this thing happen. Um, and finally, um, the thing I've really learned is there's no greater joy than giving of yourself in the service of others. Um, all those times that you go, hey, let's go play around the golf, or let's go play basketball, or go walk the dogs, you just don't get the same feeling as like even running development programs for aerospace industry. Yeah, we did it on budget, on schedule. Compared to the look of a kid, nothing compares to that. Uh, when they see their best for the first time. So, um, there's lots that we can do to help others in, in, in need. And as, as Ruth so eloquently put it a few minutes ago, um, we need to follow the call to live into our baptism, do justice, fiercely share hope, and shine our light in the world. And as she closed, it's not about just believing, it's about putting our faith into action. So, I'm going to leave you with the closing statement from Admiral McRaven's commencement speech at the University of Austin, where he said, If you want to change the world, take some risks. Step up when the times are the toughest, face down the bullies, lift up the downtrodden, and never, ever give up. If you do these things, then the next generation and the generations that follow will live in a world far better than the one we have today, and what started here will indeed have changed the world for the better. Thank you everyone for your time. Together and sing hymn number 452. Here I am. 